Canada India USA Development Forum um, Health Forum Session Two: Recovering from the Pandemic After Getting the Virus and How It Changed Your Life and Thinking About Everything. Um, this is a 12-part virtual health forum uh, supported by the City of uh, Brampton, the Advanced Brampton Fund, um, as well as by Tangentia, uh, Greens Life Sciences. Blue Umbrella uh, Financial Services and Truly Financial. Uh, on May 15th, we hosted the first session, uh, which was about the city programs and services offered uh, during the pandemic. And uh, we had uh, the mayor of Brampton, Sir Patrick Brown, uh, two city councillors, two regional councillors, and the medical officer of health, Dr. Lawrence Lowe. Uh, for today's session, we have the citizens, uh, residents, of Brampton, as well as uh, Dr. Dilkush Panjwani, who is the uh, consultant psychiatrist at uh, Trillium Health Partners, which is our keynote speaker. So uh, introducing the organization, Canada India USA Development Forum is an Ontario, Canada based not-for-profit organization working to promote bilateral and trilateral relations between Canada, India and USA CIUDF organizes events, conferences, and speaker series lectures with prominent corporate and political leaders in all three countries for ideas exchange and knowledge sharing. The forum recently opened up four memberships, and 18 companies and professionals have joined us, joined as members in the last three months. We just got one more new member yesterday, so next time we'll say 19. Uh, with the goal to raise the membership to 300 or more by December 31st next year. Um, CIUDF also hosts virtual member meetings once uh, a month. And once the pandemic measures are eased, we will host monthly brunch meetings for members and sponsors as well. Vipul Jani, myself, uh, is the founder president and CEO of uh, Canada India USA Development Forum. Here is a list of the activities that we normally do. Next slide. Now, Canada, India. Canada, India Insight uh, Conference, which is once a year. Uh, we also host the Canada, India USA Trilateral Conference once a year. Uh, business leaders roundtables, political leaders roundtables, uh, membership expansion, as I just mentioned. Uh, member networking events, virtual and in-person, uh, when uh, when it's allowed. Uh, Consul General Roundtable as well. Uh, we have just recently launched an education forum, um, a health forum, which we are conducting right now, session two uh, of 12. Um, we also have a Canada India Insight e-paper, as well as we do several other webinars and virtual sessions on uh, current affairs and issues of uh, importance. Uh, Tejas Ivoli, uh, who is helping us today, he is our health forum uh, coordinator. So with that, uh, I will re uh, repeat the topic for today. It is recovering from the pandemic after getting the virus and how it changed your life and thinking about everything. And let us get to our first uh, speaker, uh, Mr. Yash Shah. Yash Shah uh, is a Canadian entrepreneur. With Tejas, you can probably introduce him. Okay, sure. Uh, so, hello everyone. My name is Tejas, uh, and I'm going to introduce uh, Yasha. Yasha is a um, is a member of the Canada India USA Development Forum. Uh, Yash is an Indo-Canadian entrepreneur with over 25 years of experience in the pharmaceutical and life sciences industry. His company, Prince Life Sciences, has brought more than 25,000 lab products under a single platform. He's now developing it as an e-commerce platform where any product can be ordered online. Quince Life Sciences has recently introduced a deep freezer that complies with the World Health Organization guidelines for equipment to be used for storage for products like the COVID-19 vaccine, uh, which is a very timely uh, product. Uh, for more information, you can visit the website, quincelifesciencelab.ca. Uh, I'll now turn it over to Vyash. Uh, thank you, Tejas uh, and Vipul, for organizing this forum. Uh, first of all, my greeting to all of you who have joined this uh, session. And as the director of uh, Crens Life Sciences, 
it is great to be the part of this online sessions and definitely being a member of CIUDF. Uh, it is great to see that uh, how Mr. Vipul Jani has taken initiative to bring everyone, the like-minded people at one single platform. But anyway, uh, today's topic is to COVID recovery effect. So before addressing effect on my life after COVID, uh, I would like to salute the healthcare professionals of Oakville Hospital and uh, uh, Georgetown Hospital specifically, uh, doctors, nurses, and uh, I just remember the specific name, the Andrew, uh, Krishna Bauza, Dr. Chawla, Dr. Mehta, and all other healthcare staff of this hospital did their best for my recovery from illness in 10 days. And definitely they treated well, and I say that I'm blessed that I got uh, such a good professional who so took the nice care of me. And, uh, but in the meanwhile, I got a bad experience as well. While COVID diagnosed at Brampton Civic Hospital, uh, and the doctor diagnosed the COVID, that I have COVID, and he said, okay, you need to quarantine and you need to go at midnight uh, to go home. And I was surprised that why the doctor is telling me when I need uh, uh, utmost hospital care. But anyway, um, whatever is that, uh, with, the, uh, with the help of the, with the treatment of the Georgetown Hospital, I really appreciate them. And uh, I'm now recovered. That is all by God's grace and back to the team. So COVID infection, I, put, I got a positive effect too. I shared my almost uh, 10 pounds of weight. Uh, that's uh, good because without any workout or anything, that's a good thing for me. And, uh, but this triggered me to adapt in a healthy lifestyle after COVID and having a good food habits and some negative effect that my physical strength is lowered. Walking space is being a little bit, uh, not like before. But anyway, uh, what I can say that uh, I have recovered from it. And it's a, it's a kind of, I can say that 10 days was very, uh, not very good for me, uh, but with the help of the healthcare professional and the motivation from the family members, it made me to recover. So financial and business related impact was definitely there. Uh, it's still there, but I always say health, if we have the health, we can gain the health. So that, that's it. And uh, thank you. And I'm praying for well-being of everyone on planet Earth and hope so that this will go right away so soon, whether it's natural or unnatural. And we have to come up with a mental strength uh, uh, to avoid this natural or unnatural adversity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. So where do you say you to the hospital? Sure. Welcome, Dr. Panjwani, first of all. Um, myself, I'm Bipu Jani. Um, thank you for accepting our invite uh, today. Um, and we'll uh, look forward to hear from you. Uh, first, uh, we are just taking, uh, you know, the calls from the recipients uh, who are sharing their uh, individual experiences. So, uh, Yashwai, when you said you went to the hospital and, uh, you know, uh, for about... 10 days so how was the experience you know at the uh, facility yes. the facility yeah i can say that really i can put have compliment to uh, i think canadian hospitals and the canadian healthcare and at georgetown hospital definitely i have been treated well uh, when i have been diagnosed and where they checked it again at georgetown hospital the senior doctor i think he was direct director of the Georgetown Hospital, he came to visit me and he asked me everything and he said, okay, now we need to hospitalize you. But on the other side, I can say that sometimes you have the bad judgment of a professional, same what I got at Brampton Civic Hospital. Uh, uh, he let me go uh, at midnight, regardless, I needed a hospital care. So sometimes I felt that it depends on the professional, how they uh, look into that individual and not the system, but the system also, uh, but I can say that definitely I got treated well at Georgetown and Hospital. It was very nice, good experience for me uh, 
seeing the so good health care health care system in our country we are blessed sure. thank you for uh, for sharing so we'll come back to you uh, after uh, hearing from the other speakers um, so Christmas, we can move on to the next uh, speaker okay uh, hello everyone. Our next speaker is uh, Sunny Patel. Uh, Sunny is a student with the Toronto District uh, at the Toronto District School Board. Uh, he is a corporal in the 110 Black Hawk Squadron, uh, Royal Canadian Air Cadets. Uh, he is the president of uh, Toastmasters International Club, Toronto East, uh, and a lifeguard at the Scarborough YMCA for uh, almost 10 years now. Uh, he has a first degree black belt in Taekwondo. And uh, he plays uh, flute at the fourth level at the uh, Royal Conservatory of Music for, for the last uh, four years. Um, and in addition, he has completed a series of courses uh, from uh, University of Toronto, University of Michigan, University of Washington, uh, and uh, IBM Corporation on the Python programming and artificial intelligence. Uh, so, Sunny, uh, go ahead, all yours. Sure. Just before that, Sunny, quickly, I mean, uh, I can uh, barely hear. Uh, you know, uh, so is it my computer or is everybody's mic a little bit low? Um, nah, I, I think I can hear it clearly. Okay. <laughs> well, but other people I may suspect, you know, maybe their wives are sitting close to them. So they cannot mm -hmm. really. <laughs> That's not an issue with you, at least. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Sunny Pranav Patel a grade nine student council representative from Woburn Collegiate Institute. And it's an honor to join you on this forum. I am also the former youth president of Toastmasters Youth Leadership Club and active corporal with the 110 Blackout Squadron. Kindly allow me to share my experiences during COVID pandemic and its aftermath. In the month of November, my mom and my grandma were COVID positive. We were tested at the sanitary hospital and staff members were very helpful. And to get appointments, they were easily accessible online. Uh, my mom and my grandma were both quarantined and me and my dad cooked food, various kinds of healthy soups, salads, steaming vegetables, etc. We were highly dependent on our Indo-Canadian culture and Ayurveda. We used, we used the natural herbs like ginger, lemon, turmeric, garlic, and whatnot. Family friends used to deliver dinner outside of our home. We used to sanitize our home every hour. Fortunately, we are almost there for a bright summer. My dad taught me how to be self-reliant and think about others. My dad was acting as an ambassador with William Osler Hospital, and we found it best opportunity to serve the needy and vulnerable com community members. Our healthcare heroes were in need. IC wards were fully occupied, so we started fundraising. And in a couple of weeks, we raised thousands of dollars and joined Champion Circle. We believe humanity is the true soul of an Indo true Indo-Canadian, and we provide the ray of hope. Regarding my studies, because of COVID, Switching between in-person and remote learning was tough at the initial stage, but missing out on high school, high school activities, friends, gym, and etc. But we have to think about our community safety, and gradually we managed online, and it's quite comfortable. Our school is following all protocols, and actually I'm learning virtually since November last year. I must say, our working heroes are very busy in remote learning, but it's not that cumbersome. I wish once we are all vaccinated and we receive green signal from our medical professionals, I'm okay either way of learning as life itself is the learning process, obliged. Great, thank you, Sunny. Vipul? Um, sure, thank you for uh, sharing that experience and uh, we look forward to again hear from you uh, after a bit. Um, so we'll move to the next uh, speaker, uh, Tejas. Uh, Prithvi Pandya, um, he is a student at uh, McMaster uh, University um, in, the, in the computer science. Um, computer engineering, if I'm renaming the course wrong, uh, you can correct me. And uh, he has seen uh, uh, the pandemic up close. 
uh, with his own parents at home. So uh, looking forward to hear from you, Prithvi. Hi, my name is Prithvi. Um, as as uh, said, as Masa said that um, I've seen the pandemic up close and my family was really affected by it. Um, all four of us in our, in our family were uh, corona positive and throughout the time we are quarantined in the house for about two weeks and th thankfully uh, no one was super serious and my parents had mild symptoms but that was about it for us and th throughout this time what we really learned from this was uh, healthy habits right as Mr. Yashal said Corona really um, does help you uh, get better with uh, healthy habits and adopt to the uh, surroundings. So that's something that we picked up on. And that was my uptake on COVID-19. That was pretty sweet. Uh, <laughs> I am sure you went through a bit more than that. <laughs> I mean, um, so Charles, so, you know, return the favor for some time. <laughs> um, other than that, uh, school was taken online. Um, in the past one year, I've done my third year online, which is which kind of which is kind of really hard to adopt to because everything's online. There's we we barely have time to talk with professors, professors, and there's a huge um, gap with learning. It's much uh, harder to um, comprehend what professors say, especially virtually. And of course, the technical issues that always come along with it. So um, there was that. And yeah, I also miss the school life. I, I feel like I've, COVID has made uh, us lose a huge part of our school life, especially for me. And something that I really enjoy is engaging with and socializing with my, my peers. And I've, that's, I've missed out on that school activities. And yeah. So do you feel some of your friends are also going through the same experience? Maybe someone getting affected in their households, missing the studies, uh, things like that? Um, my friends are kind of enjoying COVID. They don't have to go outside. They can stay in the house all day, play games. Yeah. This is funny, but other than that, we, we do plan um, events here and there virtually through clubs, but uh, it's usually just Jackbox or Kahoot, like just to get a hang of it. Here and there. Okay, and I believe uh, your mother was also going to join today? Uh, she was actually um, had to go out. She had a therapist appointment. A dentist appointment, okay. Yeah. All right, no issues. Um, so Tejas, you want to play the video then for counselor Paul Vicente? Before yeah, just give me a minute. No. Just a minute. From Dr. Panjwani. We'll watch a brief uh, five-minute video, Councillor, uh, Peel Regional Councillor uh, Paul Vicente, um, and then uh, we'll go to our keynote speaker for today, Dr. Dilkush uh, Panjwani. That will be followed by a few questions. This event will also then be posted on uh, YouTube, uh, on our YouTube channel. And uh, usually we get about uh, 14 to 15,000 views uh, per video. Um, it will also be on Facebook Live uh, afterwards as well. We will also cover it in the paper, Canada India e, uh, Insight e-paper. So uh, of course on all of the social media as well, we'll post it as a video recording, on LinkedIn, Twitter as well. Good morning. My name is Paul Vicente. One in five. 
I'm the Vice Chair of Economic Development and Co-Chair of the Mayor's COVID-19 Economic Support Task Force. I would like to thank Vipul Jani and Tejo Zavali for inviting me to provide remarks at today's Health Forum on the topic of programs, services and resources offered by the City of Brampton during COVID-19. It is a pleasure to be here virtually and to address you all today. I'm pleased to be here today alongside Mayor Brown, my councillor colleagues in attendance and Dr. Lowe to share the work accomplished by the City of Brampton during this past year in response to COVID-19. As this was all new territory for us to navigate, we had not experienced life during a pandemic. There were times when being agile and pivoting to meet the changing COVID-19 situation was needed and we adapted rather quickly. At the beginning of the COVID-19 epidemic, it was identified that support services were needed. The City of Brampton took charge and established the Mayor's Task Forces, looking after different demographics, such as vulnerable individuals, small businesses and entrepreneurs, seniors, youth, and eventually COVID-19 recovery. This past year, I co-chaired the Economic Support Task Force and continue to do so while the province and city remain under a state of emergency and lockdown orders. I'd like to share some of the initiatives the Economic Support Task Force has done to date to help support businesses affected by COVID-19. Based on all the feedback the Economic Support Task Force has received since the pandemic started, we have shifted our approach. COVID-19 has resulted in our community needing to get back jobs and businesses that were lost in the past year. Unfortunately, we aren't talking about significant job growth, but it's a return to where they were pre-pandemic. Our economic recovery strategy is working from this reality. Some examples of where our economic development team is supporting recovery is through our Brampton Entrepreneur Center, or BEC. BEC hosts several weekly webinars to help these businesses understand and apply for grants and adjust their businesses, for example, by improving their marketing as a result of the current economic realities imposed by COVID-19. The Brampton Entrepreneur Center continues to play an important role in our community by providing virtual business advisory services, access to funding, and resources to equip businesses to respond to COVID-19 and to grow. We know that supporting small businesses and keeping the entrepreneurial spirit alive for future aspiring entrepreneurs is critical to our, to our economic well-being. We continue to improve livability and support businesses by providing $236,000 in grant funding to small businesses through the Starter Company Plus and Summer Company, engaging more than 10,000 participants through 220 virtual events and seminars, providing over 1,194 client consultations, organizing half a dozen teletown halls all sizes of businesses within different sectors. We're also trying to better understand the issues facing all brands and businesses. Since COVID-19 started, we've had numerous town halls and webinars with businesses of all sizes. The Economic Support Task Force and our Economic Development Department has remained available to guide businesses through each wave of the pandemic, providing support to them and to business owners to understand the changes to emergency orders and to ensure compliance with Ontario and Peel Public Health. Next, under the Economic Recovery Strategies Investment Cornerstone, the city launched a support local campaign in May of 2020 to encourage residents to support our local businesses. We know that the pandemic has had a devastating impact on many of our local businesses, and we have been focused on supporting local since the onset of COVID-19. Finally, if you are an entrepreneur, small business owner, and you have questions, I want you to know that you should not hesitate to connect with our Economic Development Office or the Brampton Entrepreneur Center. You can reach
reach them by email at invest at branson.ca or you can email Beck at branson.ca, B-E-C at branson.ca. Thank you all very much, and I hope you enjoy the rest of today's forum. That was Peel uh, Regional Councillor for Wards 1 and 5, uh, Mr. Paul Vicente. So over to our uh, uh, next uh, speaker, um, Tejas. Yeah, just a minute. They're joined in as an attendee. Okay. Is it possible for you to invite them? Sorry? Uh, just a second, hold on. So this again, um, while the next speaker is uh, is getting ready, uh, okay, here she is. Hi everyone, uh, I hope you're all uh, staying safe and doing well. Uh, my name is Archana and I'm here uh, to share my COVID experience. Uh, so I, uh, my, the only symptom I had for COVID is sore throat and uh, that was uh, during the temperature change in March. So it, we all, in, me and my family did not uh, really believe that it is COVID because none of my uh, contacts had tested positive or had any symptoms. So we did not uh, you know, pay closer attention for first one or two days. And then later since the sore throat uh, was still going on and I had some body ache, so we booked the test then. So since uh, there were no slots available in Peel region, I had to book my test in Halton region. And uh, I, I tested positive, so I got my results tested positive, and then uh, I had to self-isolate. And also, that is when we were trying to observe, like, okay, why did I test positive or from where did I get it? And also, we had, I was concerned about my uh, in-laws who are both uh, 60 plus, and uh, I, by then, I hadn't isolated, self-isolated yet, so I was worrying if I had passed it on to them. And also we were, uh, you know, quite uh, shocked with the results and I had to self-isolate, plan about everything and also think about how we are going to do for next 10 days or 14 days, right? So uh, that happened, I informed my workplace, they, uh, they were uh, like as the Peel region, uh, I told them, I informed them and then we also booked uh, the test for my uh, family. Uh, and then next two, three days till they got the results were quite, were quite difficult for all of us because given their age and also for me, just the worry that I might have given something to them. Uh, and that was the issue then. And then once, uh, since I had got my test uh, in Halton region, the Halton uh, health officer had to call me. Uh, and then I told her I'm Peel region resident. So then I had to call the Peel region. They asked me to call the Peel health officer and let them know that uh, I have tested positive. And the health officer called me back within uh, within 24 hours and then they did the contact tracing. And uh, uh, since there was not much because we were all, uh, I mean, me and my family, we were all following the provincial health guidelines. The only uh, outings we used to do is me going to my workplace or doing essential uh, you know, grocery shopping or going to the pharmacy. So till date, we don't know how I got COVID-19 or none of my contacts or my uh, co-workers have tested positive. So that was quite uh, surprising. And also we had to come uh, uh, with, uh, you know, creative ideas to see how to do at our home as well. Like uh, we all, luckily we have uh, enough room so we could all individually self-isolate and also had enough washroom so we could use separate so we can keep our in-laws safe mainly. Uh, so that was all uh, quite uh, stressful. 
and then uh, and also the as per the health guidelines we had though all the all three of them tested negative we still had to uh, keep a watch uh, for their symptoms so uh, we were you know we were continuously stressed for next 10 to 14 days just to ensure that uh, none of us still are carrying or none of them have covid 19 right and with all that now going back to work it is it is quite uh, different uh, because we were all cautious we weren't doing any social gatherings even then i tested positive and now i'm a bit more cautious about meeting people or going to the workplace because then when you go to the workplace you have to sanitize everything your desk your devices and the kitchen or the uh, you know lunchroom doesn't look normal you have to you know you're cautious you don't use yes anything or even the microwaves when you're using you have to sanitize before and after using all those restrictions or all those sanitization are in places in place but uh, i'm hopeful that because of the vaccination now we are all got we are all getting our first doses and after the second dose the things uh, will come back to normal and we will get back together again that is my core experience thank you for sharing it with us. Um, so, um, Tejas, if you can just uh, quickly go back to the sponsors. And then the activities. Uh, hi, if you can go back to the sponsors page uh, one more time. Yeah. And then. Uh, I will quickly introduce the organization to Dr. Palwani before we can uh, introduce him. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, the Brampton Health Forum is uh, supported by the City of Brampton's Advanced Brampton Fund, and the matching funding support has been provided by Truly Financial, Blue Umbrella Financial Services. Prince Life Sciences, Lab, and Tangentia. Um, all right, so with that, uh, just for the, uh, for Dr. Panjwani's knowledge, uh, I'll read this out briefly. Canada, India, USA Development Forum is an Ontario, Canada-based not-for-profit organization. Uh, we work to promote bilateral and trilateral relations between Canada, India, and USA and we organize events, conferences, and speaker series lectures. Um, next slide, please. These are some of our regular activities. Uh, we host an annual Canada India Insight uh, Conference, um, an annual Canada India USA Trilateral Conference, uh, Business Leaders Roundtables, Political Leaders Roundtables, uh, member networking events, Consul General's Roundtable as well between all the three countries. Uh, we have recently launched an education forum with uh, the presidents and uh, deans and decision makers of uh, various uh, colleges and universities all across Canada. And uh, we'll soon be bringing together the IIMs and IITs and ALs from India as well. Uh, the health forum, which uh, right now we are running, this is the session two of uh, 12. As I mentioned, on uh, uh, on the 15th, we had the mayor, some city councillors, some regional councillors, the medical officer of health, uh, Papil, Dr. Lawrence Law. Today, we have the citizens uh, among us. Um, on June 19, session third, uh, we'll be with uh, businesses, Ontario businesses, and uh, we are expecting a couple of Brampton-based uh, uh, members of parliament as well to join. Um, we also run a Canada India Insight e-paper, as well as we host uh, various webinars and virtual sessions on uh, current affairs and issues of uh, importance. So with that, let us introduce our keynote speaker for uh, today's session, um, Dr. Dilkush Panjwani. Um, Tejas, you want to do the honors? Okay, sure. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, it's uh, my pleasure and honor to introduce uh, Dr. Dilkush Panjwani. Uh, so, Dr. Panjwani is a uh, consultant uh, staff psychiatrist at uh, Trillium Health Partners in uh, Mississauga uh, and an assistant professor uh, in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Toronto. 
Uh, he's also the president of the Indo-Canadian Psychiatric Association. Uh, Dr. Panjwani is dedicated to eliminating the stigma of mental illness. He has uh, practiced community psychiatry for over 40 years uh, in three different continents. Uh, Dr. Panjwani believes that persons with serious mental illness have a human right to mental health treatment programs and a right to get better through accessible and equitable treatment. Dr. Panjwani is one of the founding members of the annual Lions Community Walk slash Run for Happiness in support of mental health. He has taken every opportunity to impart mental health awareness and education through public and professional lectures on the negative impact of the stigma of mental illness. Dr. Panjwani is a recipient of the Order of Ontario, Specialist of the Year Award by the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada, uh, and also the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal. With that, uh, Dr. Panjwani, I'll uh, turn it over to you. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I'll start sharing the slides first. Technology. Can you see my slides now? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, first of all, welcome everyone. This very important and timely presentation on COVID-19 in general and post-COVID problems in people who have gone through the COVID symptoms, I would say and infection. Uh, I would begin by thanking Mr. Vipul Jani, Tejas, Ayvali, and uh, all uh, Mr. Shah and everyone, including uh, Mayor Patrick Brown and all the city councillors of Brampton. You all have been doing a wonderful job along with our Premier Doug Ford and our Prime Minister. Uh, uh, Justin Trudeau. So let's start with um, the importance of all this presentation is how do we build resilience in the pandemic era? Resiliency is now the 2021 mantra. So I will begin by an introduction. In year 2020, 2020 and in 2021, humanity has been faced with an axis of multiple global crises. What are the crises? We have the COVID-19 pandemic. There's some economic disaster all over the world. There's racial disharmony, climate change, terrorism, and the list goes on and on. So mental health is no exception. We are facing a mental health crisis, believe it or not. There is a dramatic emotional or circumstantial upheaval in every person's life. And this is predicted because of the pandemic. And this could lead to serious mental disorders. 
So it is our collective responsibility, which all of you are uh, sharing, it's our collective responsibility to nurture and invest in mental health initiatives to improve the quality of life of people with mental illness. And how do we do that? Through education, equitable and accessible mental health care in the community and in the hospitals, better livelihoods, and also by creating infrastructure and developing effective public-private civil society partnerships. This is a triangular partnership. Just the government cannot do everything. Public uh, institutions have to have the support and cooperation and participation of private businesses, private organizations, sociocultural institutions, religious institutions, and civil society such as yours and many other civil societies. So this partnership will help in uh, defeating the crisis which we are facing, including the mental health crisis. So let me start with the definition of mental health. You may all know this, but I, I think we need to emphasize this, that mental health is a state of well-being in which an individual realizes his or her own abilities. They can participate with normal stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully, and are able to make a contribution to the community. This is the WHO definition of mental health. Now, stress and anxiety of the coronavirus pandemic. Why is this so stressful? We have seen sudden and rapid changes in our lives, in the, in the society and in the world. And this has caused changes in our lifestyle. It's not the past normal, it's the new normal. Most of us are socially isolated. There is unemployment. Future seems to be uncertain. So far, a lot of treatments are being tried and uh, are under the trial, but we don't have any proven treatment so far. And there is not enough vaccine available. Maybe in Canada, we are doing good, but in many countries, there is a crisis about the vaccine being given to the population. There's shortage of household and food items many parts of the world and not the least most important maybe is the overload of news and social media in social media everyone seems to be an expert on covid-19 <laughs> they are physicians or not they are experts and a lot of uh, information overload is being uh, provided through the media, mainstream media, through social media. Now, in the world of information, the world of information overload, we have to screen that and obtain knowledge. It's like a reverse triangle or reverse pyramid. Too much of information. With our intelligence, we have to gain what is knowledgeable in that, what is true, what is factual, not just fake news. And then from knowledge, we have to gain wisdom. So information leads to knowledge by screening and um, so with the knowledge, we will be able to gain wisdom on how to deal with the crisis. So what is the impact of COVID-19 on the general population? There are repeated episodes of lockdown, there are periods of self-isolation after contact with infected people. 
social or physical distancing has been observed. This fear of contracting COVID-19 when outside of the house, many people go to grocery stores and are afraid that they might contract the illness. These things have raised the prevalence of mental health symptoms. There is fear, there is confusion, there is anger, and there is grief. And we see a lot of adjustment disorders because of the changes happening in our lives. There's a lot of anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder when we see people who are dying in nursing homes or near and dear ones when we hear the news, especially in the frontline workers. And there is psychological and mental distress. Suicidal thoughts are not uncommon especially in young people who have a vision of an uncertain future, they feel hopeless, they feel helpless. Although the situation is not as bad as one has to end their lives, there's a lot of substance misuse on street drugs, alcohol abuse, and domestic violence. So what are the risk factors with COVID-19 related distress? Risk factors of subsequent mental illness is higher when people are living with young children in the home. It's very difficult for uh, people to manage their work as well as deal with the children's education and very young children. Sometimes they are not able to go to daycare centers. Ethnic minority groups are at a higher risk. South Asians, black population, some of the Jewish population. There is, if there is a pre-existing chronic or mental illness, they are more susceptible and have a higher risk. Young age and the elderly also are at risk female gender because they have to manage, they have to do three jobs now. Look after the family, look after the children, look after their work. Frequent exposure to pandemic news. I think we should limit our time in watching CNN or CBC or any other news channel because there's a lot of repetition and it causes a lot of stress. Long haulers who have suffered from post-COVID acute infection or they are long COVID, uh, they express fears, uncertainty, and despair. People with acute COVID-19 are worried about their prognosis or outcome of the illness eventually, what will happen in the future. And there is substantial mental health distress in people were admitted to ICU or are on ventilator and their families and carers are not able to visit them. They are worried about their elderly. Even if the elderly parents or grandparents are at home, it's very difficult to wear a mask even inside the house. Young people are going out to work and then come into the house and there's always this worry. So what is post-COVID? That's the uh, topic of today. So what is post-COVID-19? Or we call it long COVID or long haulers. Post-COVID-19 is defined as extending beyond three weeks from the onset of the first symptom. We all know the symptoms of COVID, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. Uh, fever, cough, respiratory distress, um, and many other symptoms. So if the symptoms exist or persist beyond three weeks, that's called post-COVID-19. And chronic COVID-19 is when the symptoms extend beyond 12 weeks. So there appears to be a multi-system disease, COVID-19 leads to that. 
The good news is that the only 10% of the people who experience mental uh, post-COVID prolonged illness. So many of such patients recover spontaneously, albeit slowly, they do recover. And what helps them is holistic support, rest, symptomatic treatment. If you have cough, you need to take something to alleviate your cough. If there's a mild, low-grade temperature, Tylenol will help. And then gradually increase in activity. By rest, I do not mean staying in bed all the time. You have to stay active. Even when uh, it's been seen that patients with acute COVID illness, if they are bedridden and do not move, it affects the, the virus goes into the lungs and settles it. When you are active, then you are able to prevent that. Sometimes, you know, when the breathlessness persists, Ohm pulse oximetry, it's a small instrument which you can buy from any medical store. Uh, to check your, uh, this is only for people who have had COVID and who have persistent symptoms. Normal people don't need this. So you can check if breathlessness occurs and monitor that. And sometimes family doctors would refer you for specialist assessment in case there is a new persistent or progressive problem. Either it's a respiratory problem, cardiac problem, or neurological symptoms, like delirium can happen, a cardiac arrhythmias, irregular heartbeat, many other cardiac conditions can happen because of post-COVID and respiratory symptoms can happen. Even thromboembolic uh, embolic phenomenon does occur. The embolus uh, clot, blood clots happen in the lungs. So for those reasons, a specialist assessment requires, is, becomes necessary. So why is there prolonged recovery? This virus, like many other viruses, and have are associated with long-term respiratory, musculoskeletal, which means the muscles and the uh, bones feel very weak and tired and painful, and neuropsychiatric sequelae, which is due to the viremia persist. And this is due to the weak or absent antibody response. Everyone has a different response, immune response to the virus. So some people who have low antibody response can have persistent viremia. A relapse or reinfection can happen. Doesn't mean that once you have had COVID, you're free of COVID. No, you can be reinfected and you can relapse with symptoms. Inflammatory and other immune reactions can prolong the illness. Mental factors such as post-traumatic stress and many other mental factors also make you more vulnerable. So the symptoms vary very widely. So mild COVID-19 may be associated with long-term symptoms. And what are these symptoms? Cough, low-grade fever, around 9900 Fahrenheit, fatigue throughout the day, shortness of breath or mild exertion, or even at rest, sometimes chest discomfort or chest pain, headaches, neurocognitive difficulties, such as difficulty or trouble concentrating, trouble making decisions, trouble remembering, recent events, so um, executive functions such as planning, organizing, multitasking, and uh, problem solving, all these can be affected. Muscle pains and weakness happens. 
GI ups, upset gastritis, then you can have upset abdomen or loose stools, skin rashes in different forms. Various forms of skin rashes can happen. Metabolic disruption, such as poor control of diabetes can take place, even though you are taking anti-diabetic. Thromboembolic phenomenon or conditions happen. Depression and other mental health conditions can also occur as symptoms of post-COVID-19 symptoms. So there seems to be no need to refer or investigate these patients if the patient is otherwise feeling better than when they were. So it doesn't mean that you have to go to see a doctor all the time, um, especially refer to for testing, etc. Testing, I mean, not just COVID-19 testing, but also various types of investigations like CT scan, X-ray chest, and many other tests are not required. So mental health and well-being, how do we achieve that? We should emphasize well-being, promote well-being rather than talk about illness. Prevention and promotion of or awareness of mental health is more important and is less economic burden because of that. There's a website called Wellness Together, which has been launched by the government of Canada. You should visit that web website in case you have any concerns about your mental health. Wellness Together. So emphasize well-being, practice mindfulness meditation, practice diaphragmatic breathing or alom milom or any of these yoga breathing exercises. Uh, yoga exercises, especially Shavasana, which is helpful for relaxation and breathing. It's very important to maintain social connection for well-being. Even though you are not meeting people face to face, you can still connect with your friends, with your relatives, with your family, neighbors, by telephone, video chat, WhatsApp, and social media. Self-care is very important, including nourish, proper nourishment, good diet, not avoid junk food, avoid caffeine and other drinks. Uh, it's better to have water, a lot of water and also good healthy food, which are low in sugar, low in fat, higher in protein. Ear support is very important. And symptom control for fever and cough, you can keep the symptom control. And mental health and well being are enhanced by increased social solidarity. We are better together. That's the slogan. So, together we can fight the illness. Informal social support to friends and family, mutual aid, and other community-based and collective measures, as our counselor mentioned earlier, uh, that economic support is also very necessary. So let's talk about how do we build our resilience? That's the key word. I started off with the title, Building Resilience. If you build resilience, you can fight any illness, let alone COVID-19. So what is resilience? In one word, or two words, it's the ability to bounce back. So resilience is a process of adopting, adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, tragedy, threats, or any significant source of stress. Resilience, usually defined as positive outcome despite adversity, is likely the ultimate goal of human maturity and the single most important target of prevention and intervention science. So as I said, resilience is the capacity to bounce back. 
This definition is by the American Psychological Association. So how do we build our resilience as individual and as society? Sociability, form healthy relationships, avoid people who are always negative, people who keep forwarding negative WhatsApp messages, political messages, which we all know that we cannot control. We cannot change a lot of things that are happening around the world. So why burden ourselves with negativity? Optimism. View the future and your own self as in the positive light. We should not forget there are two things that are important, hope and faith. With faith and hope, you can think positively and also very important is a sense of gratefulness. You have to be grateful. You have to be grateful for our family, our friends. We are living in a country where which is one of the best countries in the world, is providing us with all the support. But we have to also do our part. Flexibility. Change is part of life. So one has to be flexible and adaptable. Self-confidence. Move forward towards your goals. Is decision on confidence in one's abilities. So what if you have lost a job? You have the skills. You should be self-confident that, yes, I will find another job. Or I am in good health. I have family support. I will fight illness. Competence. Be good at something and take pride in it. Don't worry what other people say. You have to be confident and proud of what you are doing, what your friends are doing and the society is doing. Insightfulness. Understand people and situations. Be able to see the other sides, what is happening. Perseverance. Do not give up. People who succeed are the ones who persevere despite the obstacles and the challenges they face. Perspective. View crisis as challenges to be faced. Don't view any crisis as insurmountable obstacles. They are not obstacles. They are challenges and they challenge you. Life becomes more interesting when you are faced with challenge. Self-control. Manage strong feelings and impulses. Internalization of locus of control. Rather than pointing fingers at others and blaming others, look within yourself. How can I improve myself? So, what are the characteristics of resilient people? They are more open to new ideas. They assume the best rather than the worst from others. They find opportunity and risk equally fascinating. They embrace positive change. Anything that is positive, one has to accept. Action. See what needs to be done and are happy to lead the charge. An open book. You prefer dealing in transparency and honesty rather than obscurity and deceit. So, transparency is very important, not only in one's life, you have to be honest with yourself. And the government has to be transparent, the society has to be transparent, what they are doing. So, how do we cope with stress and build resilience? Establish a daily routine. Just because you're at home doesn't mean it's retirement and you can wake up at any time and sleep at any time. Have a routine. Even if you're not working, get up at the same time, wake up at the same time and do something constructive, something productive. Eat nutritious, healthy food. Get enough sleep. Sleep is a very important thing especially for young people. A lot of young people in this society are sleep deprived. 
even if it's a weekend, you have to get enough sleep. And the secret of sleep is you need to go to bed at a certain time, not wake up till 3 or 4 in the morning. Even if you had a late night, try to wake up at the same time every morning. Avoid caffeine and other drinks, alcohol. These are the things that do not help you to sleep. They interfere with your sleep. For example, alcohol is known to cut down your REM sleep or your dream sleep. And that affects your memory. So enough sleep every night. Exercise and stay physically active. If nothing, at least go for a walk or at least a few kilometers. Enjoy listening to music and enjoy reading. Avoid excessive television and social media. Limit your WhatsApp to half an hour a day, not more. You don't have to read each and every message that comes in big groups. Practice diaphragmatic breathing, pranayam, alom vilom, yoga asanas. Practice mindfulness meditation or any other form of medita meditation that you prefer. Prayer is very important. And having a spiritual mindset also builds up your resilience and also helps you to fight stress. A spirituality... I do not mean that you have to follow religion or religious thing. Yes, religion can be part of life. But being spiritual is more important. Humor, laughter, all these things relieve stress. So laugh with people, laugh with friends, stay connected socially with family and friends. Volunteer, this is very important. Volunteer to help the vulnerable and needy. Your next door neighbor who may be an elderly person, you can help them volunteer to buy their groceries or uh, you know, help them with some household chores. Pick up their mail from the letterbox downstairs. And never give up hope and faith. Very important. So last couple of slides. In closing, let us reflect on what the pandemic has taught us. <clears throat> what have we learned from this new challenge, the global challenge which we are facing? So let us salute and express our gratitude to all the selfless frontline healthcare workers, law enforcement officers, paramedics, firefighters, and all essential service providers. They are risking their lives so that we stay well. And they serve the sick and the male members of our society. Doctors and nurses are also faced with a lot of ethical decisions, like not allowing or allowing a person to meet a dying person in the ICU, or uh, dealing with anti-vaxxers and anti-maskers and all those things. We, we have to understand that we are not living alone in the society. If a society is healthy, you will be healthy. So let us transcend cultural, racial, religious, linguistic, and social differences. We are all equal. And let us make humanity our race. Let us believe that coronavirus does not threaten the existence of humanity. It will pass. We have faced pandemics every hundred years. There's nothing that the end of the world is not here. Let us accept that our lives have a meaning, a purpose, and value. We should always find meaning in what we do. Let us appreciate the importance of maintaining a balance between family, work, and leisure. Let us value health more than wealth. What is wealth? If you are in the ICU on a ventilator, no, no wealth can save you. <coughs> so, yes, money is important. But how much money do we need? 
we all eat the same food, we all live in under the same roof. Don't need to run after wealth. Health is more important. And COVID-19 has taught us that. Let there be no place for ego, pride, prejudice, or hatred. Let us be the most, let us help the most vulnerable people in our society because our moral character as individual and as society is reflected by how we treat our weakest fellow human beings. Let us together make this a new beginning of a better life and a better peaceful world. Let us strive to change ourselves, even though we might not be able to change the current situation. Let us all become citizens of the world and work for humanity across borders with cosmopolitan ethics. That's the word you should look it up. Cosmopolitan ethics is a very important term. Um, if people in India or elsewhere are suffering, spare some of your dollars which you may spend on unnecessary junk food or uh, buying extra clothes. They need this. They need support, our support, and we are providing support. So let us enhance it and let us keep our hope, faith and hope alive for this pandemic is not the end of the world. So always keep dreaming. A winner is a dreamer who never gives up by Nelson Mandela. And thank you all. Stay blessed, healthy and safe. Wear a mask. Observe social physical distancing, wash your hands and maintain all the hygienic process procedures and keep connected with all your friends and family. Thank you. God bless. Thank you. <clears throat> That's it. Pages. Thank you, uh, Dr. Panjwani. That was really awesome. Fantastic presentation. Uh, did you say something? Sorry? You wanted to say something? I said fantastic presentation. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, definitely, definitely. You are on mute. I was just telling you to unmute. Right. Okay, so I've got a couple of questions actually. Um, and then we can take it uh, from the other uh, panelists also. Um, so we'll take another 10 minutes or so. Uh, 10 to 12 minutes. I have got four questions <clears throat> of my own and then uh, maybe one question each from the three speakers. Um, so, um, Dr. Panjwani, as everybody knows, mental health was a growing epidemic even before Corona happened. Um, now with constant lockdowns, no social interactions, not much sports or outdoor activities also, have you seen a rapid increase in mental health issues? Yes, we have. Uh, although we may not classify everything that we see as mental disorder, uh, we don't want to patho pathogenize or make it a pathogenic uh, presentation. There's a lot of fear, there's a lot of uncertainty, anxiety, depression, sadness, loneliness is very important. So you can feel lonely in a crowd or you can not feel lonely even when you're alone. We have access to Google. We have access to good books. We have access to good music. We have access to friends and family members. So keep connected. Although you're right, Mr. Jani, that uh, the incidence and the prevalence of mental illness or mental symptoms of uh, psychiatric symptoms have increased during COVID. Suicidal rates have also gone up, unfortunately. So, and these are, as I said, there are vulnerable people. They are more prone. So avoid substance abuse, avoid alcohol, 
prevent. What is important is these things which are under our control, we can do it. There are certain things that are not in our control, we have to adapt to it. Sure. Um, so the next question is, since we have some um, youngsters today with us, um, kids and teenagers are, I mean, that's what some of the reports that I have read. Um, they are now even more at risk as the schools, colleges, universities, everything is online. There is, they are also, I mean, whether you like it or not, that's a fact, guys. You guys are playing video games, which are mostly violent. Um, all the time, killing people, you know, blah, blah, blah. I mean, uh, all the time, uh, bleak job prospects, all adding up, I, I believe, you know. So do you think all this will have a long lasting impact even after this pandemic is over? Well, we, I, I cannot predict what will happen, but yes, video games are have a plus side and a minus side. Plus side is that you communicate with friends. It's an activity which is not done alone, which is done with friends. But at the same time, it is not a very productive activity. Sometimes it's counterproductive when there is a lot of violence. Mind gets perturbed. You know, the human mind has to be at a balance not very excitable, not very depressed. And to maintain that balance, one has to do activities that are very productive in nature. Reading is very productive. Sure. Watching uh, good movies, watching, and you know, to have friends, you don't need video games alone. You can have friends, you can have a book club, for example. My daughters participate in a book club. People read a certain book and then discuss the book. That's a productive activity. You can do gardening. You can help your neighbor with gardening if they are not able to do it. So all these are good for the society. And uh, before I forget, I wanted to compliment all the three young uh, youngsters who shared with us their experiences, that is very valuable. And I have learned a few things from that. So thank you. Sure, so before I go back to my last two questions, uh, uh, Sunny, do you have any question for Dr. Panjwani? Um, no, I don't have any questions. Sure, Prutri? Oh, no, I don't have any questions at the moment. Tejas, you want to ask a question? So Dr. Panjwani, you mentioned uh, about certain vulnerable populations and minorities. Uh, what impact, if any, have you seen on handicapped uh, individuals? Uh, if anything, so like those who are um, physically disabled and have other disabilities are even in pre-pandemic times would have been significantly isolated. Uh, and with uh, the pandemic going on for over a year now, their isolation must have skyrocketed. Uh, so what impact, if any, have you been able to uh, discern uh, on them? And how can we, as a society, prioritize them to make sure that their recovery uh, is as good as that of the able-bodied population, if, if not better? That's a very important and excellent question. Thank you for bringing it up. Actually, it's, I can do a whole hour of presentation on that. Uh, how the COVID-19 has impacted both physical and mental disability, a person suffering from physical and mental disability. Yes, for them, isolation is very uh, negatively impacting them. Um, accessibility to care, you know, General population is also facing accessibility problems. Because of COVID-19, a lot of uh, non-urgent or even urgent procedures, surgical procedures, uh, 
accessibility to physical care, to family physician. Everyone is affected, but more so people who are suffering from physical and mental disability. Uh, for them, you know, face-to-face -face contact with a doctor or a crisis worker or a nurse was consoling, was supportive in nature. Now they can't just go walk into the hospital or into a daycare program. A lot of programs are on hold and a lot of hospital, surgical, and other procedures are on hold because of COVID. We hope that this is going to be only a temporary situation and very soon with the vaccines, uh, with the pop so at least 70% of the population, if they are vaccinated, that will help with developing herd immunity and uh, minimizing the risk of COVID-19 infection spreading. So if you wish, we could do a presentation on that itself. It's a very important topic. Sir, we'll be happy to bring you back in uh, in one of the future sessions. We have got uh, 10 more sessions after this. Um, and actually, session number four, uh, session number five is on anxiety and mental health. So we'll be more than happy to bring you back uh, <laughs> on yeah. that. That is taking place on July 24. Um, so, Yash, why you have any question? Yeah, uh, I would like to ask Dr. Dilkish Pandwani. First of all, it was a very great presentation on resilience. And really, I feel that resilience is the most important aspect during Corona pandemic. And because of this resilience and mental strength, I think I have also recovered. Uh, so, I just want to ask you, what do you think that this online learning impact on the student psychology. So how, how do you rate it? Because as I remember, and back then previously when we were students, we liked to interact with the teachers. We had some different kind of relation with the teachers as the students. But now but through online learning, I feel those kind of respect and uh, learning attitude has been changed. So just one the bottom line is that, what do you think the impact of online on learning on student psychology? Well, online learning is similar to online working. For example, I'm doing online therapy with my clients, with my patients. It's not the same. I'm often asked this question, when are you going to open your office? I said, would you come? He said, no. We won't come because of COVID. But what they are trying to say is that face-to-face -face contact, we are human beings. We have been used, uh, used to all this. Over centuries, human beings have had social contact with one another. We are missing on verbal cues. The upside of online nursing, is, uh, not nursing, the teaching is that bullying in school has gone down significantly, yeah. which is a positive way of looking at online learning. Students are not, uh, you know, some students who were victims of bullying by a few notorious students has come down. But yes, online learning and uh, the impact of online learning is being studied. We won't know for a few years how it has impacted the young people. I think uh, as young people are more adaptable to change, we in the older group are less adaptable because we are hardwired in our brain. Young people are more adaptable and I think they will find a way to this change. Also, I'm wondering what will happen when they go back to school? Will it be the same atmosphere, the same environment? 
So all this is uh, new to psychologists, to educational psychologists, and it has to be studied. And I think people are looking into it. I cannot give a definite answer about it. Sure. Um, last two questions. Right. Um, does it make a, a difference? You know, I mean, it does definitely not. Let me phrase it differently. What impact uh, do you see or what impact if a person lives in a nuclear family, you know, let's say husband, wife and kids, or if he's, he or she is living alone, single, not married, or lives in a joint family with your parents, grandparents, you know, your wife, your kids, a lot of people around, especially in today's environment, uh, how does it help your mental health? Well, joint family has its Sorry. Help or hinder. I guess if you're living by yourself, it might be a hindrance. Hindrance? For what? You, you might, like you said, you, know, you can be isolated even in a crowd. Uh, and you can be comfortable even by yourself. So uh, the, it can help being in a joint family, but it could also be a hindrance. So if you could just you know focus on both. Yeah. And joint family has its advantages. There is mutual support, even financial support. One of the member has lost his job, is unemployed. That is uh, income is buffered by family income at large. Joint family also has advantage of elderly seniors sharing their experiences and their wisdom with the young people. It's like I always wanted a buddy system. Grandparents and grandchildren, they are buddies. Grandchildren learn more from grandparents than from the parents because grandparents have more time to spend with the grandkids and also more experience in life and not in all cases, but in many cases, wisdom to ages. So th these are the advantages. The disadvantages are um, sometimes there is competition between family members or um, difference of opinion can lead to conflict situations. Uh, the so-called mother-in-law, daughter-in-law conflicts, which we see in our culture, uh, can also be detrimental. So it all depends on family to family. What is the family culture which prevails in a joint family? But nuclear family has its advantages. The main advantage is privacy. There's less privacy in uh, joint families than nuclear families. Um, but there's also lack of support in nuclear families. And living alone, that it's a choice. Everyone has a choice whether to live together with parents. Main advantage is you don't need to cook separately. You don't need to spend extra money on the rent. So the expenses are not duplicated. Sure. So the last question uh, from me today, um, with so much now focus on mental health, I see a lot of uh, advertising, governments uh, also pushing, you know, more awareness on it, lots of campaigns now in print media, electronic media. Do people now seek treatment? Is there more social awareness or acceptance? You know, that maybe, uh, or is it still a stigma, especially in the South Asian community? I spent half my life fighting the stigma of mental illness. Yeah. In, in my opinion, stigma has outlived its obituaries. 
people said stigma is dead. We have come a long way. The court, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Justice Ginsburg, we have come a long way in eradicating stigma, but we have a long way to go. In other words, stigma still prevails in individuals themselves, in family, and it has a very negative impact on the lives of the persons who suffer from mental illness. Uh, they are not able to access mental support from mental health experts because of the stigma. They are shy or they are afraid that they have they may be discriminated. So stigma has a lot of impact. And I think till our society is able to fight the stigma and eradicate it completely from the society, we are not going to see what 100% results. Uh, God, uh, you know, the media nowadays have promoted a lot of awareness. So has the government, so has Bell Canada and many other uh, uh, private institutions. Let's talk, it's one of them. CMHA's uh, promoted uh, mental health week and mental health month. May is the mental health month. So we have come a long way. Even the films, if you watch one flew over cuckoo's nest and many older films, they had a negative message about mental health and mental illness. Nowadays, Brilliant Mind and many other films have projected a positive image. So things are changing and you're right. Will we get over the stigma? We are not going to uh, achieve 100% success, although we have achieved a lot of success. Sure. Any final thoughts, Tejas? No, I'm good. Okay, so let's just put up the sponsors page one final time. Um, let's Thank you again. Everybody. Thank you again for inviting me. Yeah, just one moment, uh, doctor. We're just closing. No, no, I'm not leaving. <laughs> um, so uh, this was session two uh, of uh, 12 sessions. And our next uh, session, session number three, will be on June 19. And the topic will be how businesses are coping one year into COVID-19, uh, pandemic's effects on people's jobs and businesses, and how they're adapting to the new realities. So with that, uh, let me thank all of our participants for today, especially Dr. Panjwani for accepting our uh, invitation. Uh, and uh, to all of our sponsors, uh, especially the City of Brampton's Advanced Brampton Fund, um, and also the uh, people who are providing the matching funding, uh, Truly Financial, Blue Umbrella, Blue Umbrella Financial Services, Greens Life Sciences, and Tangentia. With that, uh, today's session is uh, now closed. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. No, thank you for having me. Ages, I can speak with you. Thank you. Later on. Yes, definitely. Thank you again. Yeah. Thank you. Sir. God bless you all. Take care. Bye bye. Have a good weekend. Bye.